Hello there, and welcome to Science Epic's 60 Years of the Space Age, a Malaysian internet podcast series that recounts the history of the human journey to outer space from the launch of Sputnik in 1957 to the present day. Last year, in 2017, marked the 60th anniversary of human beings going to outer space beginning in October of 1957. I'm your hostess with the mostest on this flight across time and space as we retell the adventures of human beings taking their first steps out into the cosmos and the great beyond from Sputnik to SpaceX I'd like to say. So if you're into that kind of stuff space technology and history this one's for you. 60 years of the space age part 13 the dream of the decade. We've entered a very special time period here on 60 years of the space age, a 10 year long stretch of time called the 1960s that saw a lot of important and interesting events happening. It was a very eventful decade to say the least, not just in the world of space exploration, but also in terms of various social movements and revolutions happening throughout the world during the 60s. Also the Beatles were coming up, so it was a great decade for music. Hey Jude, yeah. The 60s was the decade that played host to the civil rights movement, led by Reverend Martin Luther King, which opened equal rights and voting privileges to African Americans. The Vietnam War raged throughout the decade, and by the end of it, a world technological superpower, America, would be defeated by a poor Southeast Asian country, Vietnam. Woodstock and the Summer of Love happened in the 60s. That's why they call it the psychedelic 60s. And against the backdrop of all of that, the entire world was threatened by nuclear war. The very technologies we had invented proved to possibly be the reason for our downfall. In October 1962, Russian missiles of the same type designed by Sergei Korolev, the chief designer behind the rocket that got Sputnik into space, were discovered in Cuba. Just a hop, skip, and an oh na na away from the coast of Florida in the United States. The missiles had the range to hit any location on the mainland United States. Few people today truly understand how close we came to complete and utter annihilation during those tense 13 days. That's why it's worth the reminder of that event. But the world persisted. Cooler heads prevailed and we're not dead yet. We've still got a story to tell, yeah. Anyway, in the last episode, we talked about Yuri Gagarin's historical flight into orbit and his bumpy ride back down to Earth. Go ahead and search for that, 60 Years of the Space Age, Part 12, if you want to hear about it. If you want to hear about that tale that took place in April of 1961. But what happened afterwards? Well, America, like a teenage girl on her first day of high school, felt supremely insecure and decided that she needed to catch up. And immediately afterwards, like one month later, they sent their first man into space. Alan Shepard made it into space in the Mercury 3 Freedom 7 spacecraft. But his flight was not as spectacular or technologically impressive as Gagarin's flight. He did make it into space. He launched in Mercury 3 and got past that 150 kilometer altitude boundary that qualifies you as being in space. But he did not fly towards the horizon. He he was unable to fly towards the horizon at such an angle that would make the ground, that would make the curvature of the earth fall away from you at the same rate as you are falling towards it. That's what Gagarin did and it's called achieving an orbit. So Alan Shepard's flight is what we consider to be suborbital. Alan Shepard and the Mercury 3 Freedom 7 was an ad hoc quick shot reply by America to the astonishing speed at which the Russians were achieving record firsts in space. Even with Mercury 3, they had to rely on Werner von Braun and his team to do it. For those of you newly tuning in, Werner von Braun was a German rocket engineer. He was from Germany that had went through the Second World War. And he was essentially the American version of Sergei Korolev. But his circumstances in coming to work for America and NASA were different. He was dealt a slightly different hand after the Second World War because of his history uh, as a Nazi scientist. 
instead of being hella promoted to the top position of the rocket program like Korolev, the U.S. government was reluctant to turn to Von Braun at first because of the whole Nazi thing, but he continually proved his worth, even though he pretty much started out from the bottom with being assigned to build just basic military rockets for America's Redstone Arsenal. In fact, the Mercury spacecraft flown by America's first astronaut was actually called the Mercury Redstone spacecraft. That was proof that Von Braun could walk the talk. His contribution in the 60s would be very important to space exploration. So the space race between America and the Soviet Union was truly now heating up. Since 1960, a charismatic, a new charismatic and lady killer whoop, of a president was in charge, and his name was President Kennedy, John F. Kennedy, actually. The legends call him JFK, and we all know his story of how he would got, get assassinated later in what was probably one of the most defining moments of the 20th century. JFK would lead America through the Cuban Missile Crisis that I mentioned earlier in October of 1962. But beyond that, in his three years in office, he would lay the foundation of America's aspirations in space. He would tell the people to aim for the stars, but in doing so, pushed America to get to the moon. JFK and the Gov, which totally sounds like a cool indie band name, would set the dream of the decade for America, and in doing so, begin a revolution in the country. What kind of revolution? Well, the kind that changes the world forever, of course. The kick started this revolution into motion in May of 1961. A month after Gagarin had taken flight, JFK gave a speech to the American Congress talking about the impact of space exploration on the hearts and minds of people all over the globe, all over the world. He talked about setting long-term goals on urgent time schedules, which is something that Few governments and few head of states, heads of state, few leaders nowadays don't really talk about much. They don't really handle that, those kind of issues. Politicians are often, they often constrain themselves into thinking within election cycles. They never think about what the, their decisions could do, could have impact beyond the decade. They never think about what direction their decisions could carry their people beyond a decade. Very few politicians do this. And this mentality, this thinking by JFK and the Gov, led to changes that were made during the 60s that will play a huge role in determining America's position as a leader on the world stage further down the road because of various changes in industry. And because of that direction they were on, billions of dollars began to be pumped into NASA and space research in the early 60s. It was already a billion dollars going into 1960 and would peak in 1965, which is, which is the highest that NASA funding would ever get was that year in 1965. And it's way more than NASA gets today. We had a podcast talking about the formation of NASA and how that got started. I think it was part 10, the birth of NASA. But yeah, today's NASA budget is nothing compared to what it was in those years following the flight of Yuri Gagarin. Today, as cool and as awesome as the things that NASA does, it gets less than half of 1% of the federal budget of the United States. Back in the 60s, it was eight times that. I think it was about 4% of the federal bud budget. So you can see the difference of where the priorities were since the days of JFK and the beginning of this space race. All of that money was put into training the people needed to man the command centers, training the astronauts to build the launch centers, the gantries, and, and then also building the rockets like the Mercury, the Gemini, and eventually later on the Apollo that would get Neil Armstrong to the moon. It was really like an explosion within those first five years of the 60s. They really wanted that leg up over Russia. There was a lot of stress about it within the White House. There, there was this one time Kennedy was, President Kennedy was consulting one of his advisors for a solution on how to surpass the Russians in the space race. And he was like, how do we tackle this problem? How do we, who do we ask? Who do we bring in? I don't care if it's that janitor over there. If he can do it, let him do it. So you can see how desperate and critical the situation was that America catch up. America also crossed another milestone in the space program during the early 60s. 
They ended the Mercury project and started the Gemini project that would get them one step closer to the moon. The Mercury project was the first American space flight program, American human space flight program that would involve astronauts that began since the very inception of NASA in 1958. It was supposed to have beaten the Soviets into space, but it fell short by a month. Mercury's object objective was to achieve orbit, just like Gagarin did in 1961, but they only managed to get into orbit in February of 1962. Remember, Alan Shepard's flight was suborbital, almost there, but not quite. America would finally achieve orbital capability in February of 1962 with astronaut John Glenn flying three orbits around the Earth. But the Mercury series spacecraft were designed, now this is where the difference is in technological applications between the Russian side of things and the American side of things. The Mercury series spacecraft were designed from the get-go to give more control to the astronauts, manual piloting control, unlike the Soviet spacecraft, which tended to be more preset and remote controlled from the ground. And unlike the Soviet re-entry vehicles, the, the astronauts didn't have to like eject and make a dangerous parachute jump hundreds of meters off the ground when they came back to Earth. The American capsules tended to land in the ocean, but this gave way to other dangers. The second Mer Mercury spacecraft called the Liberty Bell 7 that came back to Earth carrying astronaut Gus Grissom got waterlogged and sunk into the bottom of the Atlantic Ocean. The capsule would only be recovered several decades later in 1999. And Gus Grissom almost died. So if you imagine that if that happened, what kind of hoo-ha the media would have over that kind of event. Now the next spacecraft in the works, the, now that was the Mercury project. Following that, beginning in 1963, sorry, not 63, 61, beginning in 1961, was meant to test the waters for a future mission to the moon. Sort of like what we're doing now with the Mars rovers, if you want to look at it that way, optimistically. There are some important things that Gemini would have to do, would have to achieve before a ship could be cleared to go to the moon. It would have to satisfy some engineering design challenges. The Gemini spacecraft would have to be able to operate in space for as long as the flight time, flight duration it was to get to the moon. That's three days going and three days coming back. It would have to be able to fly in space for six days straight. The Gemini spacecraft in the works would have to support astronauts on EVA operations. That's EVA is a term that stands for extra vehicular activity, the act of putting on your spacesuit and going outside your spacecraft and doing things outside of the ship. And finally, the Gemini would have to support orbital docking maneuvers. That's the ability to combine with another space vehicle and to fly using the engines of the target vehicle. This would be necessary for like when they land on the moon, they have the descent module and the module that would stay up in space. There was the lunar module, which would go down to the moon, and there was the command service module that would stay up in orbit around the moon. So they were with Gemini, they were going to practice doing this. So that's why they built the Gemini, so that they could have trial runs before they actually build the actual spacecraft Apollo. So there's a lot of new and exciting things they had to achieve. America was going to achieve, in, there was a lot of new and exciting things to achieve in space that America was going to aim for, but it would also give rise to a lot of disastrous problems, catastrophic failures, and even some tragic deaths too, all of which I will talk about in the following episodes, so stay tuned for that. All of this was going on while the Russians would also be daring to do things even bolder and even more awesome things. The space race was turning up and evolving into this technological orgy with both sides giving it everything they got to boldly go where no one has yet gone before. And also beyond all the flashy new rockets and incredible space flight that took place going on in the 1960s, another thing that had developed alongside the things in space was the attitude of human beings and people on the ground. Everyone wanted to participate in this new adventure, in this new frontier. Kids wanted to be astronauts, 
Students wanted to be engineers, and adults wondered where this crazy race would take the human race to, and it would eventually all shape us generations later into who would we who we would become today. Well, if you want to find more, found out more about that, stay tuned to our program, 60 Years of the Space Age, here on Science Epic. Thanks for watching, thanks for tuning in, and I'll see you next time. Swoosh! If you enjoyed this content uh, that we have here on Science Epic, 60 Years of the Space Age, be sure to help us out by dropping a donation on our Patreon. Like, comment, and subscribe. Follow us on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram. Thanks for watching. And I will see you next time. Boop.